Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to go through the NICE guideline on thyroid disease, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. Right, we're not going to waste any time, so let's jump into it. We will check thyroid function tests if there is a clinical suspicion of thyroid disease, bearing in mind that one symptom alone may not be indicative of thyroid disease. We'll also check if there's type 1 diabetes or other autoimmune diseases, but we will not offer testing only because of type 2 diabetes. We will also check if there's new set AF, depression or unexplained anxiety. We will also check if there's abnormal growth in children and young people or if they have an unexplained change in behaviour or school performance. And we will also be aware that in menopausal women, symptoms of thyroid dysfunction may be mistaken for the menopause. We will not test for thyroid function tests during an acute illness unless we suspect the acute illness is due to thyroid dysfunction because it may affect the test results. So what tests do we do as initial screening when thyroid dysfunction is suspected? This will depend on whether we suspect a primary cause, that is, a cause arising from the thyroid gland itself, or a secondary cause, that is, a cause arising from the pituitary gland. Although the PATH lab will have processes to decide what tests are included when we request thyroid function tests, it is important for us to understand what tests we should expect according to the clinical presentation. So, we will always measure TSH. Then, if a primary cause is suspected in an adult, if the TSH is high, that is suggestive of hypothyroidism, we will need the free thyroxine level of 3T4. If the TSH is low, that is suggestive of hyperthyroidism, we will need the free T4 and free T3. However, if we suspect the secondary cause, that is, pituitary disease, or if we are testing a child or young person, we will need results for both TSH and free T4, and if the TSH is low, that is suggestive of hyperthyroidism, we will need free T3 as well. So, in summary, we test TSH and T4 in hypothyroidism, but in hyperthyroidism, we need to add T3 too. We can repeat these tests if symptoms worsen or new symptoms develop, but no sooner than six weeks from the most recent test. We will also ask patients about their biotin intake because a high consumption of biotin from dietary supplements may lead to falsely high or low test results. Looking at the management and monitoring, different rules may apply to children and young people. And given that we're likely to be getting advice from the pediatricians, I will not cover them here. If a recommendation applies to children, I will mention it, but otherwise this episode will focus on adults. So, we're going to cover primary hypothyroidism, which is caused by an insufficient hormone production by the thyroid gland. In this situation, the TSH is high and the free T4 is low. Subclinical primary hypothyroidism can sometimes happen as a precursor of clinical hypothyroidism. And it is when the TSH is high, but free T4 is normal. Thyrotoxicosis is when there is excess thyroid hormone, leading to a low TSH and a high free T4 and all T3. This can be caused by increased production and secretion, as in primary hypothyroidism, or by the release of stored thyroid hormones, as it happens in thyroiditis. Subclinical primary hyperthyroidism can also sometimes happen as a precursor of clinical hyperthyroidism, and it is when TSH levels are low, but free T3 and T4 are normal. And we will also cover thyroid enlargement with normal thyroid function, which is self-explanatory. So let's start with the management of primary hypothyroidism. So, for all people with confirmed primary hypothyroidism, that is, when we encounter a high TSH and a low free T4, we will check thyroid peroxidase antibodies, and in adults we will now repeat the antibodies. If the antibody test is positive, it may be worthwhile mentioning that NICE also recommends testing for celiac disease in people with a diagnosis of autoimmune thyroid disease. 
for the actual management for both adults and children, we will offer nivethyroxine as first-line treatment and we will not routinely offer liothyronine or natural thyroid extract for primary hypothyroidism, either alone or in combination with nivothyroxine, because there's not enough evidence that it offers benefits over nivothyroxine and the long-term adverse effects are uncertain. We will start nivothyroxine at a dosage of 1.6 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day, rounded to the nearest 25 microgram for adults under 65 with primary hypothyroidism and no history of cardiovascular disease. However, if they are over 65 or with history of cardiovascular disease, we will start levothyroxine at the dosage of 25 to 50 micrograms per day with titration. How should we follow up and when it took primary hypothyroidism? We will aim to maintain TSH levels within the reference range when treating with levothyroxine. If symptoms persist, we will adjust the dose to achieve optimal well-being, but we will avoid using doses that cause TSH suppression or thyrotoxicosis. We also need to be aware that the TSH level can take up to six months to return to normal for people who have had a very high TSH or a prolonged period of untreated hypothyroidism. In terms of monitoring, we will need to measure TSH every three months until the level has stabilized. That is, until we have two similar measurements within the reference range, three months apart, and then once a year. But we will also check free T4 as well as TSH if they continue to have symptoms of leuthyroxine. Let's now look at subclinical hypothyroidism. Once we have confirmed subclinical hypothyroidism with a high TSH and normal free T4, we will also check thyroid antibodies. In terms of management, we will take into account features that might suggest underlying thyroid disease, such as, for example, symptoms of hypothyroidism or thyroid autoantibodies. We will consider levothyroxine if the TSH is 10 or higher on two separate occasions, three months apart, monitoring as seen hypothyroidism. We will also consider a six-month trial of levothyroxine for adults under 65 with subclinical hypothyroidism who have a high TSH but lower than 10 on two separate occasions, three months apart, with symptoms of hypothyroidism. If symptoms do not improve, start in levothyroxine, we will recheck the TSH and if the level remains raised, we will adjust the dose. If symptoms persist when TSH is within the reference range, we will stop levothyroxine and continue monitoring. So how do we monitor and treat the subclinical hypothyroidism and after stopping treatment? In this situation, we will check TSH and free T4 once in a year if they have features suggesting underlying thyroid disease such as, for example, raised levels of thyroid autoantibodies, or once every two to three years if they have enough features suggesting of underlying thyroid disease. Let's now have a look at thyroid toxicosis. First, we will have confirmed the diagnosis with a low TSH and raised free T4 and or T3. Then, we will need to differentiate between thyroid toxicosis with hypothyroidism, for example, Graves' disease or toxic nodular disease, and thyrotoxicosis without hypothyroidism, for example, transient thyroiditis. We will do so by measuring TSH receptor antibodies to confirm Graves' disease and considering technician scanning of the thyroid gland if the antibodies are negative. We will only consider ultrasound for thyroid toxicosis if they have a palpable thyroid nodule. In terms of treatment, we need to be aware that transient thyrotoxicosis without hypothyroidism, like in thyroiditis, usually only needs supportive treatment, for example, with beta blockers. Otherwise, we can consider antithyroid drugs along with supportive treatment for adults with hypothyroidism who are waiting for specialist assessment and further treatment. Bearing in mind that the use of cardimazole is subject to MHRA advice on contraception and risk of acute pancreatitis. B 
before starting antithyroid drugs, we will check for blood count and liver function tests. Antithyroid drugs for hypothyroidism secondary to a single or multiple toxic nodules will normally be with a titration regimen of carbimazole. However, we will consider propylthiuracil for adults who experience adverse reactions to carbimazole or those who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant within the following six months or those who have a history of pancreatitis. We will stop and do not restart any antithyroid drug if a person develops agranulocytosis and we will refer to a specialist for further management options. For the monitoring of antithyroid drugs, we will check TSH, free T4 and free T3 every six weeks until the TSH is within the reference range. Then, TSH every three months until antithyroid drugs are stopped. Rechecking free T4 and free T3 if the TSH becomes suppressed at any stage. We will not monitor the full blood count and liver function test while taking antithyroid drugs unless there is a clinical suspicion of agranulocytosis or liver dysfunction. After stopping antithyroid drugs in adults, we will check TSH within 8 weeks of stopping, then TSH every 3 months for a year, and then TSH once a year, always rechecking free T4 and free T3 if the TSH becomes suppressed at any stage. I will not cover the follow-up and monitoring of hyperthyroidism after radioactive iodine treatment or surgery, as this will be guided by secondary care. In terms of the management and monitoring of subclinical hyperthyroidism, that is when TSH is low and free T4 and free T3 are normal, we will seek specialist advice if they have two TSH readings lower than 0.1, at least three months apart, and evidence of thyroid disease, for example, in gluta or positive thyroid antibodies, or symptoms of thyroid toxicosis. Otherwise, in untreated subclinical hyperthyroidism, we will check TSH every six months, and if the TSH level is outside the normal range, we will also check free T4 and free T3. We will consider stopping TSH measurements if the TSH level stabilizes, that is, we have two similar measurements within the normal range three to six months apart. Let's now have a look at thyroid enlargement with normal thyroid function. We will offer an ultrasound if there is palpable thyroid enlargement or focal nodularity if malignancy is suspected. When making decisions about whether to refer for fine needle aspiration cytology, we will take into account the ultrasound comments on echogenicity, microclassifications, vascularity, and lift tendinopathy amongst other factors. How should these patients be managed? Well, we will not offer any treatment in non-malignant thyroid enlargement, normal thyroid function, and mild or no symptoms, unless they have breathing difficulty, or there is a clinical concern, for example, because compression is suspected. But we will repeat the thyroid ultrasound scan and the TSH if malignancy is subsequently suspected, or compression is suspected, or the person's symptoms worsen, or they develop symptoms such as hoarseness or shortness of breath. Obviously, if the thyroid enlargement is causing compressive symptoms, we will refer them for further management. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.